your glory. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. This is the eighth verse of chapter 7 of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. To the unmarried and the widows, I say it is well for them to remain single as I do, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. To the married I give charge, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is consecrated through the wife and the unbelieving wife is consecrated through her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner desires to separate, let it be so. In such a case, the brother or sister is not bound. For God has called us to peace. Wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? Only let everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him and in which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was any one at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was any one at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Everyone should remain in the state in which he was called. Were you a slave when called? Never mind. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of this opportunity. For the, he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man in the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were taught, bought, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, brethren, whatever state each was called, there let him remain with God. One of the basic practical questions new converts at Corinth were asking was over questions over marriage, family, and sexuality. And it's easy to understand why. Corinth was widely regarded to be the most immoral city in the Roman Empire. In fact, the word Corinthesthai means to live like a Corinthian. It means to live a life of debauchery, immoral debauchery. The converts at Corinth rightly understood that Christianity had a different understanding of marriage, family, and sexuality than the dominant culture. But, that they, were, but they were not exactly sure how different. After all, one of Paul's primary themes had been freedom. No one talks about freedom in the Bible more than Paul. And so what did all this talk about freedom have to do with marriage and family and sexuality, the Corinthians were asking. The Corinthian converts or at least some of them, were not sure. Moreover, having grown up pagan, 
Some were not so sure that Christianity was going to require much more of them than any other religion of the empire when it came to marriage, family, and sexuality, which uh, wasn't usually much. You see, for most Greeks in the first century, the purpose of religion was to help one transcend the body, the material world and its many concerns. For many, this was the essence of freedom, to escape, to transcend the desires and concerns of this world in order to live somehow above the world, above the prey. To most Greeks, this was what religion was for. This is why drug use was so popular in Greek religion, in the many Greek religions. So if the purpose of religion was to free oneself from the concerns of this world, if its purpose was to help one transcend the, the cares of this life, to escape the body, the material world, and its many concerns, then what about marriage? and family. Talk about a realm that has many concerns. So what about marriage and family, Paul? Can't we now basically ignore the fact that some of us are now ma- are married? Does it really matter anymore, Paul? How are we to regard the institution, the bonds of marriage and family, now that we have become Christians? Are marriage and family really relevant or necessary concepts for us anymore? After all, isn't our own individual freedom the most important thing? Is this not the sort of freedom that Christ calls us to? And of course, the Corinthians were not the last people to ask these sorts of questions. Some were no doubt thinking, this is my chance to get out of this lousy ball and chain marriage I've been in for so many years. This is my chance to get rid of that miserable old man I've been living with or that miserable old woman I've been living with. This is my chance. Besides Paul, he or she is not a Christian can you expect us to stay married to an unbeliever? But notice what Paul's response is. He says, don't think that getting rid of your unbelieving spouse is going to help or make you any freer. If he or she consents to live with you, do it. Don't break the bonds of marriage you may actually learn something worth knowing, which might even serve to save you and your spouse. The next question the Corinthians raise is over one's cultural identity or ethnicity. Some of the Corinthians were apparently wondering if becoming Jewish, getting circumcised, eating kosher, might be of help or provide some sort of advantage spiritually. But Paul says, no, that misses the point. Becoming a Jew or trying to change your ethnic or cultural identity isn't really going to help you or give you any spiritual advantage. Self-identifying as a Jew or assuming any other cultural or ethnic identity is not going to help you become any free. But then comes an even tougher question. Okay, Paul, what if you're a slave? Now, one reason this was such a tough question is because nearly two-thirds of Corinth's population were slaves. Corinth was utterly dependent upon the institution of slavery. And no one questioned its legitimacy. No one. Corinth was a thriving, prosperous, metropolitan, multicultural city. 
a major trade center in the Roman Empire. It was full of ambitious, upwardly mobile people. It also had a large number of residents who were recently freed slaves. Many had come to Corinth to make it rich. But alongside these ambitious, upwardly mobile Roman citizens and freedmen and women were a huge number of slaves, many of whom had become converts, or at least some of them, converts to Christianity. And the life of a typical slave in the Roman Empire was not good. It was terrible, beyond words. It could be. Paul knew the horror of slavery. He knew its cruelty, its brutality, and its inhumanity. That's why he tells slaves in verse 21, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. If you can get your freedom, get it. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Don't sell yourself back into slavery. Apparently some were contemplating this very thing, perhaps as indentured servants for a time. But Paul says, don't you do it. Remember, you were bought with a price. Now I know you can find people today who say the Bible sanctions, supports, and even underwrites the institution of slavery. Uh, You can find plenty of pseudo-sophisticates on television or even at universities who will say the same, but they are not very careful readers of Scripture. Nowhere does Paul sanction, support, or underwrite the institution of slavery. On the contrary, he rejects it. He scorns it. He tells slaves to possibly can. Yet there's a much deeper concern or deeper point that Paul is making in this passage. He tells members of the Corinthian congregation that if they're already slaves and they can't get out of it, they shouldn't spend too much time worrying about it. He says, never mind. Your true freedom is not dependent on this. It's not contingent upon your being a slave of men. The only thing that ultimately counts is whether you're a slave of Christ. For he, Paul says, who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man in the Lord. Likewise, he who is, was free when called is a slave of Christ. In other words, you're going to serve somebody, but if you are a slave of Christ, you are free no matter what others may call you. But if you don't serve Christ, you're still in bondage even if you think you're free. No matter what you think or what people call you, you're still a slave. You see, for Paul, true freedom, the freedom we have in Christ, isn't dependent upon our outward physical or or even legal constraints. Our freedom lies deeper. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Paul doesn't spiritualize the concept of freedom as if freedom were simply a state of mind. Paul is not saying there's some sort of spiritual freedom on the one hand and a physical or material freedom on the other, as if the two were separate and didn't really have anything to do with each other. He's not saying the freedom Christ brings is only spiritual and that it doesn't have concrete implications. No, Christian freedom has concrete implications for the real world. Why else would Paul tell slaves to get their freedom, if at all possible, and not to make themselves slaves of men if he was interested only in their inner spiritual condition and not also their outer physical condition? But Paul's understanding of freedom does not hinge, you see, upon a distinction between inner and outer spiritual and material freedom. Rather, it hinges upon a distinction between a freedom that is freedom for and a freedom that is freedom from. Let me try to explain. For Paul, there is simply no real freedom 
No freedom worthy of the name that does not begin with freedom for God. Freedom for fellowship with God. If folk talk about freedom apart from freedom for God or for fellowship with God, they're not talking about true freedom at all as far as Paul is concerned. For Paul, all other forms of freedom, however beneficial they may seem, ultimately lead to bondage if they don't begin and end with freedom for God. This is, of course, a different kind of freedom than most of us will be celebrating on Saturday. And here's another difference. For Paul, true freedom, freedom for God, freedom for fellowship with God, is a pure gift of grace. Unlike what the Declaration of Independence assumes, the freedom, this freedom that Paul is talking about, is not something we have naturally or simply by virtue of being born in this country. It's not something we're all inalienably endowed with. Nor is it something we can attain through our own efforts or achieve by hard work. It's a gift of grace through faith in Christ, not a gift of nature. The freedom Christ brings, according to Paul, is first and last freedom for God and for each other. Not freedom from God and from each other. The freedom Paul talks about does not free us from our commitments and duties to one another. Our God-ordained relationships and responsibilities. It frees us for them. It even frees us for some relationships, responsibilities, and duties imposed upon us by others that are not God-ordained. Though we are strictly warned not to impose them on ourselves and get free from them if we possibly can. Here there appears to be some congruity between the freedom Christ brings and the freedom many of us will celebrate this Saturday. But the point I want to make is that there is a fundamental difference too. The freedom Christ brings first and last is freedom for, whereas the freedom celebrated by most of us on the 4th of July is primarily freedom from. Namely, freedom from this or that external tyranny or force or bondage. Freedom from this or that duty or commitment imposed upon my life from without. Freedom from this or that obligation or encroachment upon my individual will. The assumption is that if left alone as an autonomous individual, I am free. It's external forces, commitments and obligations and relationships that inhibit, encumber, and perhaps even enslave me. So we must safeguard against them. This is what Rousseau, who was so influential in the 18th century and on some of our founding fathers, was getting at in his notion of the noble savage. Perhaps you remember this noble savage concept that man left to himself in the bush might be a savage, but he'd be a free and noble savage. It's society and government that corrupts man. That's Rousseau's idea. In other words, the reason why the preacher's kid is so bad is because he plays with the deacon's kids. You're supposed to laugh at that, okay? <laughs> That's my mother said that. It didn't, it didn't work. It wasn't true. Do you believe that? Do you believe that left completely alone, you are free? Do you believe if left completely to yourself to do what you and you alone want, that you would then be free. As children of the Enlightenment, that's what many of us were taught. We were taught that the liberation of the individual 
was the greatest liberation of all. That the most important freedom was the freedom from any power in, or influence outside the autonomous self. We were taught that if we could create a society where everyone was self-determining, free to choose, free to express themselves and to be themselves in any way they wished, we would then have a truly free society. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I love my country. I'm grateful to be an American. And let me say this as emphatically as I know how. Some of you know that my wife is a German citizen. Our fathers were trying to kill each other in the Second World War. I am very grateful that my father and his friends whooped her father and his friends in the Second World War we would be living in a very different world had it been otherwise. We have a lot to be thankful for. What enormous sacrifice it took to build this nation. What enormous sacrifices were made in order to defend this nation. What an enormous privilege it is to live in this country. And we ought not to take it for granted. But that said, we're facing some Serious problems. We seem to have adopted freedom from rather than freedom for as our primary definition of freedom. How else do you explain the fact that our divorce rate is the highest in the industrialized world and has been for over 50 years? How else do you explain the disintegration of so many American families in the last 50 years? I, I take, please, believe me, I take no pleasure in bringing this up. Is it not because we have been in such hot pursuit of our own individual life, liberty, and happiness that we don't seem to be very free for each other? We've been thinking of freedom as freedom from various obligations and commitments and demands, rather than as freedom for obedience, for fellowship with God and with each other. We've been thinking about freedom primarily as the capacity to do what we want, rather than to do what is right. And if freedom is primarily the power to be anything I want, should it really come as any surprise to us today that there are individuals who seek to self-identify in ways that contradict the stubborn reality of their chromosomes and DNA? Whatever high and noble notions our founding fathers had about freedom, the definition of freedom as individual autonomy stands in stark contrast with the kind of freedom Paul talks about. Paul tells the Corinthians, don't think that by severing your relationship with your spouse, your family, your ethnicity, your social or your professional status, that you're going to be any more free. Don't think by abandoning your post, your commitments, your present station in life, that you're going to be any more free. Yours is a, not a freedom from these things, but a freedom for them. Freedom for God. Freedom for fellowship. And for your present and post stations in life. Indeed, it is precisely in maintain, maintaining these relationships and fulfilling these commitments that mysteriously we find our freedom as we follow Christ. Many think today, oh, if I could just get the right wife or the right husband or the right set of children or the right pair of parents, if I could just get the right job or the right house, if I could just get the right financial portfolio, then I'd be free. Paul says, don't count on it. Don't think any of these will make you any your freedom doesn't ultimately depend on any of these. But again, please don't misunderstand me. 
There are many forms of bondage and tyranny that can encroach upon our lives, professionally, economically, and politically, and that we should seek liberation from. And I agree with the Founding Fathers that the tyranny of government is a serious problem. It's been a serious problem throughout history and has caused untold suffering and misery throughout history. But what about the tyranny of the autonomous self? What about the tyranny of my own desires? Is not the greatest, the deepest, most incorrigible bondage the bondage of our wills? That's what Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers thought. What good is freedom to do what I want if what I want is wrong, twisted, simply another form of bondage in disguise. I've said a lot already that could be easily misunderstood this morning. So I might as well say one more thing. Let's face it, brothers. There are real challenges and particular burdens in being a wife, a mother, and a woman today. And brothers, our sisters, there are real challenges and particular burdens in being a husband, a father, or simply being a man. And if you don't believe that, perhaps you weren't paying too close attention on Mother's Day or Father's Day. And there are real challenges and burdens when a man marries a woman and a woman marries a man even under the best circumstances, so I've heard. You see, a part of the curse of the fall was that enmity came between the woman and the man. Have you experienced any enmity lately? If so, then it shouldn't be too hard to understand why some would want to simply walk away from these real challenges and particular burdens, it can be so hard. So I heard. Now, I don't want to overly simplify complex issues, and I know I am broaching some that are very complex, but I simply want to say on the basis of this morning's passage that the burdens we bear in our various relationships can be borne not least of all in our marriage and our family, as difficult as they may be. And such burdens may turn out to be our greatest blessings. What feels like and perhaps is our greatest means of bondage, we may discover was and is the means of our greatest liberation. What may have appeared to be holding us back and maybe we discover that which has been sustaining us all these years and God has been using to sanctify us. Brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, parents and children, do not fear. The freedom of the children of God begins precisely where we think in our humanity it ends. God is still in control. Nations come and go. So do Supreme Court decisions but God's word abides forever. Fear not. There is no substitute for having a mother and a father, and the love and the guidance of each is unique and irreplaceable. Do not fear. Scripture says, do not put your trust in princes, or for that matter, the people. You may think, True democracy was not served in our country this past week, and you may may be right. But let's not kid ourselves. Democracy will not save us. Our hope is in the name of the Lord, who made Creator, who has made heaven and earth. We belong to Him, and in belonging to Him, we are freed from ourselves and from the tyranny of our own desires so that we can experience true freedom and fellowship with God and with each other.
And that is a beautiful thing. And this is good news. And it is for you. Let's stand and sing our middle hymn. Oh, I'm sorry. There are people who want to take up the collection, for which I should be glad. Come please. Thank <laughs> you. 